Hello, my name is Dr. Allison Hodacek, and I'm a third year resident in the University of Wisconsin Family Medicine Residency Program in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm here again today to discuss sepsis and septic shock. In our first podcast, we discussed the definitions of sepsis and septic shock and reviewed their pathophysiology. In this podcast, we'll be discussing the initial steps in workup and management of sepsis and septic shock. We'll start with a case. In this example, let's pretend that you are a physician working in the ER. The patient you're seeing is a 68-year-old male who comes to the ER via ambulance. He was too weak to get out of bed this morning, so his wife called 911. She states that the patient has been complaining of feeling run down for the past couple days. Yesterday, he felt warm and she took his temperature. It was 102. This morning, he seemed confused. He mentioned to her that he needed to get up and go to work, but he retired years ago. She notes that he has had a cough for a few days. Yesterday, he also complained of some abdominal pain and of feeling warm. His vital signs on arrival to the ER include a heart rate of 120, respiratory rate of 24, blood pressure of 80 over 50, temperature of 102.3, and a pulse ox of 90% on room air. So even with that information alone, you can see there would be concern for sepsis, right? The patient meets criteria for SIRS because he has tachycardia, tachypnea, and an elevated temperature. You suspect infection because he has had a cough and has been feeling run down and subjectively febrile. Remember that SIRS in the setting of suspected infection is sepsis until proven otherwise. Further, his hypotension is concerning because this could mean he has septic shock. So what do you do next? It's important to always remember to address the ABCs first regardless of the problem. So you want to make sure that he is protecting his airway, breathing adequately, and has adequate circulation to perfuse his vital organs. So let's say that he's protecting his airway. He is tachypnic and his oxygen saturation was only 90% on room air, so you add some supplemental oxygen by nasal cannula. So what about his circulation? He is hypotensive and tachycardic, so that's not good. This brings us to one of the most important initial interventions in sepsis, and that is IV fluid resuscitation. Remember that in our discussion of the pathophysiology of sepsis, we reviewed that patients with sepsis get vasodilation and capillary damage that leads to decreased tissue perfusion. By increasing a patient's intravascular volume with IV fluids, we can work to start counteracting these effects. You want to obtain either two large bore peripheral IVs or a central venous line. A central line is preferred because it allows faster administration of IV fluid and there are certain medications such as pressors that can only be administered through a central line. Additionally, certain hemodynamic parameters like central venous pressure can only be measured through a central line. For fluids, normal saline is best because its higher salt content promotes retention of fluid in the intravascular space. Usually, we start with a one liter bolus and reassess. If a patient has no congestive heart failure, sometimes a 500 milliliter bolus might be used to avoid fluid overload. Finally, all of these patients should be on a continuous cardiac monitor. Once steps have been taken to acutely stabilize the patient, the workup can be commenced. The goals of the workup should be to find the source of infection and to evaluate the extent of end organ dysfunction. Finding the source of infection is obviously important, so it may be treated appropriately. Treatment of infection is, ultimately, the treatment of sepsis. The reason that the extent of organ dysfunction needs to be assessed is that it gives us more information about the severity of the disease process. Recall that severe sepsis is defined as sepsis with evidence of end organ damage. Finally, we want to start empiric antibiotics to treat the infection as soon as possible. In terms of searching for the source of infection, very often it can be obvious from the patient's history or exam findings. However, sometimes it is not so clear. Universally, all of these patients need to have blood cultures drawn. The workup also typically includes a urinalysis and culture, a chest x-ray and possibly sputum cultures, 
and a focused physical exam to assess for intra-abdominal pathology, skin infections, or joint or bone infection. A lumbar puncture may be obtained if meningitis is suspected. If a patient has an indwelling line like a home pick line or a dialysis line, cultures may be drawn off that line to assess if it is the source. In regards to labs to evaluate the extent of disease, there are several that are routinely ordered. A CBC with differentials should be obtained to assess for leukocytosis with a left shift, which would help affirm the diagnosis of infection. Remember though that elderly patients may not mount the same immune response as younger patients and may present with a normal white blood cell count. Also remember that leukopenia may be seen in sepsis. It is important to check for anemia as severe anemia can worsen tissue hypoxia in the setting of sepsis. Finally, some patients with sepsis may develop DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation, so following a platelet count is warranted as well. A complete metabolic profile should be obtained. This will screen for electrolyte abnormalities as well as acute kidney injury or renal failure, which may be seen in sepsis. Liver enzymes should be assessed as well to rule out hypoxic injury to the liver. Finally, an ABG and lactate should be strongly considered as well. An ABG gives us an accurate assessment of the patient's acid-base status. Recall that in septic shock, the body's organs are hypoperfused and become hypoxic. These tissues are forced to then undergo anaerobic metabolism. This results in lactic acid production and a metabolic acidosis. Lactic acidosis is an anion gap metabolic acidosis. If blood lactate levels are elevated or if an ABG demonstrates an anion gap metabolic acidosis, that provides evidence of tissue hypoperfusion. Measures must then be taken to correct that. In the next podcast, we will address specifically how we try to correct tissue hypoperfusion in septic shock. Finally, empiric antibiotics must be initiated. If the patient has a clear source of infection discovered during workup, therapy may be directed toward the likely pathogens from that source. However, a great majority of the time, we are not exactly sure what the pathogen might be, so we start with very broad coverage. Empiric antibiotics should be aimed at covering both gram-negative and gram-positive organisms. If pseudomonas is suspected, two anti-pseudomonal antibiotics should be administered. In summary, the first step to management of sepsis includes recognition of the disease, followed by patient stabilization, in particular the ABCs, venous access, and IV fluid resuscitation. This is followed by the search for possible sources of infection and initiation of appropriate empiric antibiotics. Finally, laboratory evaluation to assess the extent of end organ dysfunction should be completed. We've covered the initial steps in management and workup of sepsis. In the next podcast, we'll discuss how septic shock and severe sepsis are managed, and we'll discuss the use of sepsis management protocols.